Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Brian Marcelino, and I welcome you to today's session on the topic how ENL Group built a data mesh architecture with Dremio and Agile Lab. Today, we will learn how ENL Group worked with Agile Lab to implement Dremio as a data mesh solution for providing broad access to a unified view of their data and how they use that architecture to enable a multitude of use cases. I'd like to welcome our speakers for today. First off is Jeremiah Morrow, is a Partner Solution Marketing Director for Dremio. He is responsible for supporting all of Dremio's partner ecosystem, including cloud service providers, technology partners like Tableau and others, and channel and systems integrators. Jeremiah joined Dremio in February of this year. Over the past 10 years, he has worked in partner and industry marketing, analyst relations, sales and business development for a number of companies in the technology industry including Vertica, OVH, Software One, and Gartner. Next, we have Nicolo Bidotti. He is a big data ad architect at Agile Lab. He has supervised and designed architectures of many large-scale data integration projects in a variety of sectors, ranging from utilities to IoT to FinTech, and is now focused on data mesh initiatives. He has been working for Agile Lab for the last six years. And we also have Akile Barberi. He's a member of the ENL Digital Platform, EDP, development team with the role of data platform product owner. He is responsible for the development of the OLAP access to model and data mesh paradigm adoption inside the platform. He has been working for ENL for more than 10 years. In addition, his current position, he has also dealt with application management, project management, and agile development. Outside of ENL, he worked in telecommunications sectors in structured companies such as Siemens Mobile and Nokia Siemens Networks. Welcome, everyone. We're glad for you to be here today. Without further ado, over to you, Jeremiah. Thank you, Brian. Um, first, uh, I want to just go through a quick agenda for this session. Uh, I'm going to start off with a section about Dremio. Um, Nicolo is going to give a data mesh introduction. Uh, Akile is going to talk about how ENL Group uh, built their data mesh. Um, and then Nicolo is going to come back and talk a little bit about the Dremio implementation uh, by Agile Lab. Uh, as Brian mentioned, we will have some time at the end of this for Q&A, so please submit your questions throughout the session. First, I'm going to kick off uh, with a quick overview of Dremio, and I'm going to level set with the reality that data teams in every organization are being asked to do more with less. Uh, business leaders overwhelmingly want their companies to be data driven, and so we need to democratize access to data and enable self-service analytics. We need to support new data driven initiatives and projects, including data science and building data driven applications. Um, SLAs for reporting and business intelligence are decreasing and getting closer and closer to real time. And we have to do all of that while maintaining the highest levels of security and governance. But it's getting more difficult every day. <clears throat> uh, data is exploding. Um, more and more users require access to data. Uh, so data teams are fielding more requests than ever. Budgets are flat. And talent is difficult to hire for and even more difficult to retain. The data explosion has added complexity to data pipelines. Uh, decades ago, businesses invested in proprietary data warehouses, which were great at analyzing structured data from business systems housed primarily in the data center alongside them. Uh, but data warehouses struggled to keep up with the growth of semi-structured and unstructured data, which has led to the adoption of data lakes, first with HDFS on-premises, uh, and then with cloud object storage, uh, which today represents some of the largest growing data volumes in our organizations. To make that data usable by data warehouse platforms, data teams need to build ETL pipelines to move data into proprietary formats so it can be analyzed. And even then, they need to create data copies in the form of BI cubes and extracts to meet performance SLAs for various use cases. Uh, this has created this pyramid where, as we move closer to the data end user, we have decreasing flexibility and scope of the data, and changes are very manual. As a result, many data teams are struggling uh, and experiencing a bottleneck where data requests can take weeks or even months to fulfill. Multiple data copies create a governance risk uh, and a challenge for end users who overwhelmingly want a single source of truth uh, for all of their data. The Dremio Open Lakehouse platform reduces <clears throat> a lot of the complexities um, by delivering SQL analytics directly on data lake storage. 
the open lake house consists of two parts. Uh, first, Sonar, uh, a SQL query engine that accelerates query performance, provides full ANSI SQL functionality on data lake storage, and provides a semantic layer so uh, businesses have the ability to work directly with the data uh, for analytics and exploration. The second component of the open lake house is Dremio Arctic, uh, which is an intelligent meta store for Apache Iceberg. Um, Apache Iceberg is an open table format for cloud object storage that is growing in popularity. Um, Dremio Arctic automates many of the optimization, governance, and uh, data management tasks that makes, and makes data as easy to use as code. The key to this solution is that it's completely open. Uh, Dremio Arctic works with other engines like Spark and Flink, uh, and Dremio Sonar works with other data stores, including relational databases and NoSQL databases, on-premises object storage, really wherever your data lives without requiring multiple copies of the data. That openness and no copy architecture is especially important as we talk about Dremio as an enabler of the data mesh. So these are some of the benefits uh, and advantages that Dremio customers see. Um, we see our customers achieving faster time to insight. Uh, it's not unusual to see customers uh, experience 10 times or faster query acceleration with Dremio. Um, data teams are more productive. Uh, they're spending less time on their backlog of data requests and more time actually innovating with data. Um, data consumers are more con self-sufficient. Um, with the semantic layer, they're able to accomplish a lot more with data that they would normally rely on the data team for. Um, and finally, uh, customers experience reduced complexities uh, in their data pipeline, which results in lower costs. Uh, many of our customers see a, a reduced total cost of ownership. Uh, so that's a little about who Dremio is. Um, now I'm going to pass the mic over to Nicolo for a quick introduction of Agile Lab and the concept of the data mesh. Over to you, Nicolo. Thank you, Jeremiah. So, welcome everybody. Uh, so, Agile Lab, who are we and what do we do? Uh, we are a company that, as, as a whole, we really value uh, transparency and collaboration and results. This has enabled to have many, many successful projects over the years. Uh, we work with a totally decentralized and self-managed approach. This has also enabled us to tackle with a very, very flexible approach, a lot of the coming challenges uh, both in in the real world and in our work. Uh, so this has helped us develop uh, a truly international culture and mindset, uh, which we are, we are very, very proud of. And all of this without ever letting the, the customers down. Uh, so the, the things that we are involved in are mostly uh, data engineering. This has been our core mission since when we were founded in 2013, so nine years ago now. And we have crafted many, many end-to-end -end data platforms for customers across uh, all kinds of industries, from utilities to FinTech to IoT. Uh, we help them develop their data strategy and bring their business to the, to the next level as well as providing uh, managed data services for, for some of them. So uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is a brief introduction to the data mesh topic. So uh, we, we create a bit of, of common vocabulary for maybe of some of us who haven't uh, had too much time to delve deep into it. So uh, what is data mesh? Well, it's it's a part of the shift uh, that's not many other ways to put it. Uh, it really arose uh, from the field, so from the ground up. That, that dissatisfaction that, that Jeremiah was talking about before, with how long it takes to bring data, uh, to onboard it, to make it available, uh, really helped push uh, a new approach to the way we want to do data engineering. Uh, starting from, from the previous, uh, let's say, standard, which was uh, the data lakes and previous data platforms. And the data mesh really does uh, bring with it some revolutionary promises, okay? Uh, it really, really is meant to deliver a lot, okay? And uh, it manages to do this in with an evolutionary approach with, with regards to technology. So 
uh, it doesn't require you to throw everything away, uh, invent new technologies, okay, but it works uh, with, what, with what is there. Okay. It, it centers on, on using those technologies. Uh, it's not bound to any specific one, okay? So it doesn't bring with it any kind of technological lock-in, so to speak. But the way it does this is it's mostly uh, an organization and archi an architectural pattern, okay? And uh, it leverages uh, domain-driven design. So those of you who are familiar with using it in design software system, we will find many of the, of the concepts in data mesh as well. So um, a couple of points. Uh, let's say that uh, the, the very first thing that data mesh wants to change is you stop just ingesting data into a centralized platform, but you focus on, on serving it, on making it available. Okay, uh, You enable people to actually discover and use the data without simply going into the data lake, finding what's in there, uh, extracting it and loading it into their systems uh, without maybe having too much knowledge about what that data is, how it got there, uh, who's responsible for it and, and who owns it. And also, uh, it does away with the idea of just moving data around with, with centralized pipelines, but it really focuses on, on making it uh, a publishing system for events. Uh, you treat the events that flow inside your, your, your data system as, as a stream of data. And finally, the way you do this is you build uh, a new ecosystem of so-called data products, okay? You do away with your centralized data platform with all the data sets around there and you actually make those data sets into products in the sense that of something that people want to use uh, and they want to know something about that has an owner that has a team behind it somebody who has domain experience okay and the pillars of data mesh okay uh, they sort of uh, you sort of start with what's called federated computational governance this is basically setting up uh, all the various policies, strategies, technologies that you want to use in your data mesh. And with that clear, uh, you start building a self-service platform and it's truly self-service, okay? So this is very, very tech focused. Uh, you really want the people who use the data mesh and build their own data products to be able to create their own infrastructure provision any kind of resources that they need uh, without having to go through costly uh, approval processes or having to deal with a lot of teams with continuous handovers uh, because that really doesn't help you do what you need to do, which is actually use that data to, to create value. And once you have this, you can start thinking about your data as a real product, okay, something that you build uh, with passion and love, and that people then want to actually use, okay. Um, this actually enables you to get to the nirvana, which is the decentralized domain ownership, and this is where the organizational shift really happens, okay. So you move away from the centralized data team, and you finally get to the domains actually owning the data, not just shipping it off to a central platform with a central team that really uh, is, is too far from the domain of the, from the, domain of the data to uh, do well with it. So a um, couple more things about data mesh. Um, we have already talked about data as a product. Uh, we haven't talked too much about the organizational uh, approach. Um, we will go to more depth in this later, but it's basically you, you leverage, uh, each data product will leverage its own team, which is cross-functional in the sense that all the various uh, capabilities, okay, that you need to build a data product are inside the same team. You, you don't have to continuously move uh, requests from one team to the next to, to achieve what you want to do. 
And another thing that's important to keep in mind is that data products, uh, since you want people to be able to use them, as many people as possible, this also means you have to expose the data in a way that's useful uh, for many different people, which means having different paradigms, uh, which is what we mean when we say that data products are, are polyglot, okay? So they can expose OLTP interface, uh, OLTP interfaces, uh, the event streams that you talked about before. Uh, so you have to enable people to use the data in, in different ways so that everybody who actually needs the data can, can do it proficiently. And once you, once you manage to do all this, uh, you actually get a very, very fast iteration time because you actually remove those thin bottlenecks. This, an, this is uh, a virtual cycle, okay? Because the faster you can build new data products, uh, the faster other people can use those data products and you create this mesh of data products. And with that, you, you hopefully can, can finally realize uh, your data-driven dreams. Uh, about the platform, uh, I want to point out a couple of things here. Um, at the top of, of, the, of the drawing, you have your various data products in, each inside their own data domain. And the data domains uh, mostly map to business functions. Okay? So your sales domain, your customer domain. Okay? But then to enable all of this, uh, you actually need your self-service platform, okay? And this is where all the uh, cross-cutting technologies come into play, okay? So everything from your data catalog to your data quality monitoring solution to your orchestration, monitoring, security, uh, lineage, everything in this is provided by the platform. So the data teams only have to work to actually build their data product. They don't have to build infrastructure, okay? They can just uh, go to the platform, ask for it, and get it delivered, okay? And this also enables you to have common standards, uh, which are very, very important to achieving interoperability uh, and making sure that actually those polyglot interfaces can be understood and consumed by the others. Finally, uh, just a couple of words on data product and this is really uh, your quantum okay your, your architectural quanta in the data mesh uh, your data product is an independent component okay which is which has high functional cohesion meaning it only concerns itself uh, with the data it manages okay uh, that's why you have a dedicated team and that's what enables that team to actually own it they know it they built it, they work with it. They have the support from the business, okay? The people who actually understand the data, the people who have uh, the knowledge of what kind of value they want to bring, okay? And this quanta uh, is deployed and operated by that team without the complexity explosion that comes from having a team having to manage a growing number of data pipelines, okay? And having increasingly less time to manage every single one of them, okay? And this approach enables you to actually uh, scale, okay? And parallelize the work that you need to build your mesh across multiple teams. And remembering what we said before about domain-driven design, uh, if, if you see, if you look at this, what you are doing really is extending uh, your domain-driven design approach uh, from, from the microservices world to the data pipelines world. And with this introduction done, I will handle it to Akila. Oh, thank you, thank you, Nicola. Uh, welcome to, to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here um, for us and, and share what we have uh, uh, done and which has been uh, uh, um, our technology and work model challenge. Uh, before start, uh, let me spend a few few words about uh, about Enel. Um, Enel it's an uh, Italian company. It's uh, uh, one of the most uh, 
um, big electric utility in, uh, in the world. We are present in, uh, in a lot of country with our uh, business uh, based on um, different uh, business line, line sorry, like uh, the global power generation. Uh, it has in charge uh, uh, to accelerate uh, the energy transition to, to, to the clean energy production, um, powered by the, the, the renewable uh, energy and uh, the decarbonization objectives. Uh, we have the global infrastructure network that must guarantee in the very complex context the quality of the services in the energy supply uh, creating uh, efficient, resilient, and digital networks. Uh, we have uh, an RX that enables customers to, to transition energy by providing them uh, with innovative services and, and system flexibility, uh, for example, uh, by promoting uh, electric mobility. And uh, at the end, we have the, the, the retail business line that have been charged uh, increase customer value with uh, um, a specific focus on their uh, satisfaction and the improvement of the, um, the experience. Um, just to, to, to give uh, you, um, uh, to try to give you uh, an idea about uh, the complex uh, of, of context in which we, uh, we operate, uh, and uh, about the big transformation coming in this sector, uh, I show you what is foreseen in the next two decades. Um, a fourfold increase in the production of uh, energy from uh, renewable sources, almost uh, a doubling of the distribution capacity uh, of uh, electricity grids, uh, and uh, uh, an increase in uh, electricity consumption related to the uh, electrification greater than uh, 40%. Uh, therefore, a very significant impact uh, are uh, expected, especially on uh, distribution network, uh, increasing uh, the complexity of the management, considering the extreme variability of, uh, of, of the um, uh, the load due to uh, electric mobility, for example, and distributed generation where the flow uh, of the energy is not, um, uh, is not longer uh, unidirectional uh, as in the past, but uh, uh, in these cases can be also uh, bidirectional. Um, so um, to, 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 to cope with this scenario, Anna decided uh, more or less two years ago, uh, to orient uh, its business on the platform model. Uh, that is uh, to become a utility as a platform. Uh, so the uh, reuse of development uh, of the develop development components, uh, the, the standardization of the, the software development and quality process, uh, the scalability, uh, extracting value from the data, a low data dem democratization, uh, create sustainability and remain open to the, to the innovation is, uh, is for us uh, fundamental in, uh, in such of a, a, a complex uh, uh, context. Now, what we've done, uh, before starting to talk uh, about how we have um, implemented the, the data mesh paradigm, uh, within Enel and how Dremio and uh, Agile Lab are helping us uh, on this, uh, I will try to explain um, from where we started and share with you uh, why we have created uh, our customized software um, development platform. We can say that uh, uh, our software development model was a, a, a serious based model. So uh, each application was uh, 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 a monolithic for us. Uh, for a specific country or for a, a global needs, uh, uh, it was a monolithic. So that means that e each uh, application, each solution had a dedicated infrastructure, specific technologies, own security attention, specific skill, etc. 
Uh, but uh, it's happening that uh, uh, asylos needed to use data of other silos. So this means copying the data from one part to, uh, to the other. And this means data uh, proliferation. In addition, to, to try to, to extract value from the data, most of them was, uh, was copied into the uh, data warehouse or big data lake. And this means, again, data proliferation. So uh, this was uh, our starting situation. And, uh, and uh, in, uh, in this situation, we needed to get answer to many data common, uh, common issues. But uh, um, uh, which, uh, which are these data management common issues? Uh, a fourth question is uh, how can we know uh, what data is contained within, uh, within the silos? Uh, we should search within each application because it uh, uh, doesn't exist a centralized data repository, for example, a data catalog. So remember, each silos was a monolith for, uh, for us. Um, another, uh, another question is uh, um, uh, after the data has been copied, which is the original? Uh, a silos to be able to use a, a data copied must uh, also sure that the uh, alignment process works fine and uh, uh, that the source data are available to be copied, obviously. So who have in charge the responsibility to keep aligned all, uh, all the copies? Uh, really, uh, we have to do a copy, or could be there any other, uh, any other way? Uh, my opinion, this is the real, uh, um, the real question, the real underlying question. Again, um, who is the responsible for the data copied? The original data owner or the uh, or, uh, uh, new one? So uh, which sense take the words ownership in, this, uh, in these cases? Um, again, each silos, it, uh, we say that is a, a monolithic, so it's a, a, a micro world. And each team uh, developed their application uh, as they think is better. But from the consum consumer point of view, um, could be, could be um, that the necessity to access to the data, not only just using uh, a simple API, but for example, uh, accessing uh, with the, uh, a massive request. Uh, so in this case, how we can ensure that the silos has implemented uh, a right architecture to be able to serve the data in both cases? Uh, if they will not care this aspect, uh, we could generate uh, uh, an internal the night of service for for, uh, for examples. Um, so uh, now we try to analyze the issues related to the use of the um, data warehouse and, and data lake uh, uh, architecture. What typically happen in these cases? Uh, in addition, in addition to the uh, proliferation and copying the data inside. Uh, of uh, the data warehouse and data lake. In, in these cases, we, we can also have uh, uh, other kinds of problems. Uh, there are usually three actors in these, uh, in these scenarios. On the left, there are the people who make their raw data available uh, without knowing how this data will be used and uh, from, uh, from whom. Uh, for example, they don't care what happened if they decide to change the data model. They don't really know uh, the ATL logic uh, used to bring the data into the uh, data lake or data warehouse. In the middle, uh, there are the people that must manage data coming from the source target without know the domain, uh, the value of this, uh, um, without have any ownership of, um, on them. But they must create ATL data post-processing, data cleaning before server to final consumer the information. They are strongly impacted by a change in the data model 
uh, at the source. Uh, so there is a, a quality problem here, a quality uh, problem of, of the data and also a quality problem related to the services provided. Uh, on the right, there are the people that want to use the information data. They want to catch value from them. They need to do it fast. Uh, so they would like to have quality. They must be confident that the, the data are valid, but unfortunately, they don't know the, the complexity on the, previous, uh, on the previous step. And in the large company, where uh, are managed uh, a lot of data and different business needs, uh, this, uh, this approach is not scalable. And uh, all of the possible issues listed before could have uh, a big impact uh, on the core business. So um, what, we have, uh, what uh, um, we have done, uh, for all um, this reason, Hanel has uh, chosen uh, to change the, the development uh, model from a, a monolithic approach to a platform model uh, based on the data mesh paradigm. Uh, we have found all the answers at the previous data uh, management common, common uses. Uh, as already said uh, before from, uh, from Nicolò, a data mesh is it's a, a paradigm shift. So the data is seen as a data product. Uh, a data product is inside of a specific domain according with the domain driven design. And uh, this means that we have a decentralization ownership of the data. Data products are uh, managed inside of a domain from a cross functionality team where uh, are present both competence, uh, the ownership of the data, but also the data engineer that work on them, all subjected to a centralized governance that guarantees also uh, the decoupling between who want to use the data product and uh, uh, the data into the domain. So the ownership of the data is clear. Data are servered without uh, need to replicate or copy uh, the information. It's very different from using uh, the data warehouse or data lake or a serious approach. Uh, and say it again, uh, uh, again, as I said from, from Nicolò, a, a data product must be discoverable, addressable, trustworthy, self-describable, interoperable, secure, but this has been a radical change, not only from a data architecture point of view, but also uh, um, a radical mentality change for our uh, developers. And this uh, last aspect uh, has been not so, 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 so easy. Uh, we had work uh, hard uh, on the architecture in evaluating different technologies, uh, on the process of transition and uh, adoption of, of the platform. And obviously, uh, we had work hard also on the people's men mentality. But uh, uh, we succeeded together. Uh, uh, all is now available in Anna, uh, and this is strategic for us. Flamio uh, represents uh, an important piece of our uh, customized NL digital platform. But uh, why, uh, why Dremio? Um, Dremio, because, uh, for example, Dremio has a, a, a seamless integration with our uh, digital platform technologies. Uh, we were looking for an SQL engine to enable the coupling from the consumer and the exposed data, but in the same time have high performance, valid scalability, and uh, specified uh, the ability to integrate with the rest of uh, our ecosystem. Uh, in a special way, for this last point of view, the Remio is uh, it's open source. So we had the possibility to explore and govern it. Uh, it's not a black box, so that is important. For example, we, with the 
Agile Lab support, uh, we have uh, uh, worked to develop a custom plugin to allow access data according with our, our uh, constraint. Uh, again, from uh, uh, performance and scal scalability standpoint, Dremio has a feature such catching a reflection based on object store, like uh, S3, for example, which means uh, potential in infinite scalability uh, at a low cost. Uh, we chose Dremio uh, more or less two years ago after a PUC, um, a proof of concept, where uh, we have uh, uh, appreciated the real high performance uh, compared uh, to, to other competitors. Uh, with Dremio, we are able uh, also to reach the source of truth of the data. Uh, also for uh, uh, analytic access, uh, we don't need to copy or replicate data. So no replication is needed. This is a, a, a crucial um, aspect for, uh, for us. And Dremio helped us also to develop uh, our uh, um, federated data governance to manage um, massive data access like uh, uh, business intelligence application, data exploration, uh, best processing, uh, using a virtual data set and, uh, and uh, access control list. Last but not least, uh, Dremio support uh, different cloud provider. Uh, and this is an important uh, um, aspect for us because our platform is now based on uh, Amazon and uh, Azure that are both supported by, by Dremio. So what I can say in conclusion, I can say that uh, we have done a great work. Probably we are uh, among the first company with this dimension and uh, uh, complexity to, to have implemented a custom platform uh, using a data mesh uh, uh, architecture paradigm. Uh, Agile Lab and Dremio have been uh, an important value for us. Uh, to, read the, to reach this uh, uh, this result. Uh, so, from my point of view, I think that uh, that's all. I finished my presentation, and again, really many thanks. I'll take it down from here and give you a couple more details on how we actually used Dremio to implement the, the data mesh in, in NL. Uh, first, a couple notes uh, on, on features of Dremio that we're going to see later are very, very useful. Uh, first of all, uh, Dremio, in contrast to other virtualization systems, is not just a virtualization system. Uh, it virtualizes your sources, so you don't have to know the specifics of each of them, but it is also a very, very efficient and high-performance uh, SQL engine okay, that can directly connect to the various storage and sources. Uh, so this enables you to uh, reduce the number of systems uh, that you have to manage, that you have to integrate in the data mesh in the centralized platform. Second uh, is the caching abilities of Dream. Um, in our setup, uh, we leverage the object storage itself as a caching layer. Uh, we use it with reflection to cache uh, your pre-aggregated all of cubes, okay? Uh, so you can get very, very good performance uh, very, very cheaply uh, without stressing too much the various sources. Uh, in other kind of virtualization systems, you don't actually have caching capabilities built in, so you sort of have to use another external system as a cache, and typically something much more complex uh, than an object store, which then has to be managed, uh, monitored, kept up to date, scaled whenever it's needed. Uh, in contrast, an object storage, you really don't have to do much of it. Okay? It just works. It's a very, very simple approach, and it's very, very effective at that. And finally, uh, if you want to deploy Dremio uh, as a layer in your data mesh, you don't want it to become a bottleneck, of course. And here, the, the, capability, the scaling capabilities of Dremio uh, really, really come to shine. Uh, you can have your queries, and they can be pretty complex at times. They can be seamlessly distributed to, the, to your executors, and then you can also choose to have uh, various uh, 
engines, okay, and doing, for example, various kinds of queries, uh, which you can choose where each query runs with uh, a rule system, okay. And for example, you can choose to have uh, one query engine for each domain, for example, so that uh, you can have them uh, not step on each other's toes, okay. And then you have the caching layer, the caching system that we talked about before, which is, again, on object storage. And this means that it's basically infinitely scalable. Uh, and, okay, one thing that's important to, to keep in mind is that uh, this cache isn't really caching query results, so it's not, you don't use it to cache what the consumers ask from you, okay? Uh, you choose what to cache with the reflection system, and uh, with that, you can optimize uh, your your query times, uh, and this these reflections are reusable across queries, okay? Because they are on they are done on the pre aggregations or materializations of the data sets that the query ran against, so they are broadly reusable, okay? And the query planner in Dremio is very very good at choosing uh, when to use them how to use them. So uh, let's start to see the, the very first thing in which Dreamio really helped. So um, we talked about before, uh, you have your data consumers uh, and they have to be able to talk to the various data products, okay? So they have to be able to understand the various interfaces uh, that they get. Uh, the thing is, if you start having, for example, multiple query engines, uh, your consumers typically have to be able to talk to each and every one of them. And usually this means mostly going uh, the JDBC route, okay? especially for the final consumers, your, your BI systems. And the issue here is, is that, of course, one driver does not fit all. Uh, you have to have each specific JDBC driver okay, installed to be able to query a data product that uses that technology. However, this is actually coupling your consumers, your clients, uh, to your serving systems. Um, the issue here is, is that your data product is supposed to be an independently deployable unit. Uh, and yes, you may be able to set some standards, so uh, we use this, this, and that, so you only have to support this, this, and that. But the issue then becomes, if you want to add another one, uh, the consumers have to be aware of this. The consumers have to update to be able to use those new features. Uh, and uh, yes, you do need multiple technologies in a data mesh, of course, uh, because each use case uh, has its own specific needs, okay? And no single tech can uh, fulfill them all. Uh, also, your data mesh is evolutionary, meaning it changes, uh, changes with the technologies, okay? And you will have many data products across many domains, and each of them has to be free to adopt them independently from each other. And also, in the case of NL, and in many other cases, your data mesh is actually expanding uh, on a multi-cloud landscape so how can you how can you avoid this or well, what can you do how can you use Dremio to fix this well it's a virtualization system so what you can do is use Dremio as a SQL engine and a virtualization engine on the set of technologies that you choose to adopt so your data consumer only all your data consumer needs to understand is uh, Dremio, okay? So you only really need one JDBC driver. And Dremio will then take care of actually forwarding you, executing your queries, uh, hiding uh, from the consumer the complexity of the technologies that it's actually using uh, to fulfill your query. And the consumer doesn't really need to know anything about those, meaning you are free to adopt new ones, duplicate older ones, and the consumers don't really need to care. Also, uh, 
you're not going to get to the data mesh in a matter of weeks or months or even years in some cases. Uh, the kind of companies in which the data mesh really shines are the complex ones. And the complex ones have a lot of pipelines already built and you can't really expect everybody to stop whatever they're doing and move on to the data mesh and not do anything, any other thing in the meantime. Okay, it's the bootstrapping problem. It happens with a lot, uh, basically every time you do a paradigm shift like this. However, what Dremio also enables you to do is it can also support the technologies that existed before the data mesh, okay? Maybe there's, for example, good old Hadoop uh, or your proprietary uh, database system uh, that you choose not to introduce in the data mesh. However, you really, really want to enable people who are moving to the data mesh to do as much as possible, as early as possible. And this means that having something like Dremio, which allows you to do efficient joins between various data products, uh, allows you to do query federation between the data, what's already in the data mesh and what's still outside of the data mesh. Okay. And another thing that Dremio does really well is integrate with this kind of technologies, your classical data lakes. So get a single interface to access all the silos and everything already in the mesh, all without coupling your consumers to any of these specific technologies. Okay. And you can also get a single catalog for your data. So let's take a look at the broader view of the way that this is realized in the NL platform. So at the top, you have your final consumers, uh, BI data scientists, uh, people who want to query the data in the mesh. Uh, at the center of this, we have Dremio, which acts as our central layer, okay, as our enable, enabler, uh, with its own very efficient and very nicely tunable caching system and its SQL engine capabilities. And to integrate it with the custom parts of the platform, uh, what we have is uh, a custom platform connector that enables it to talk to the entities, which are sort of our data products in this case. Uh, it enables you to talk to S3, enables you to talk to the third-party databases, and it mediates the interaction with these systems and the platform components, okay? So your data governance system that allows you to track and monitor what's going on with your data, uh, your central data catalog, okay, in which you have all your schemas to make everything discoverable. Uh, it communicates with your data product marketplace, okay, to enable people to actually understand what's in a data product, uh, how to use it, uh, how to get access to it, okay. And this is intermediated by security framework that was built in the platform. So really at the center of the platform, uh, Dremio can be used to tie all of this together, okay, and do it in such a way that you also get uh, a very, very simple, uh, unique endpoint for your consumers. And just to give you an idea of what the data products look like, okay, uh, your big hexagon here is your data product, which exposes its nice SQL output parts powered by Dremio's virtual data sets. And you can also choose uh, whether or not to apply a reflection to those, to cache those intermediate steps to speed up the queries. And you also, of course, leverage the physical data sets to map uh, your file storage, for example, data on your S3 or ADLS in this case. And this information, okay, about the SQL output parts is made available by cons to, to consumers so that they know how to consume those and how to access them and how to request access to them through uh, the data product marketplace 
and the data catalog. So what you get from all of this is really uh, something that's very, very good uh, for what Anna was, was trying to achieve. And now to talk a little bit about uh, multi-cloud, which is sort of holy grail, the next step, the, the vision here. Uh, so why do you want to do a multi-cloud? Uh, I mean, these are not all the reasons that could bring you to choose to pursue a multi-cloud strategy, but they are certainly the, probably the, the most pressing ones. So the very first one, you have less lock-in. Uh, nobody likes to be tied to a single vendor's uh, roadmap, mission, uh, vision, uh, business model even. Okay, uh, It's not good. It's not healthy from, from a business standpoint. Uh, also, you have savings. Uh, you often run into the situation in which similar services uh, from different cloud providers have different prices because, again, they choose to adopt different business models. Or they choose to push more in one direction and less into another one. So they structure that the pricing structure is, is different. And you might, might want to try to leverage uh, savings that you can get from using one cloud provider for a set of features and another cloud provider for another set of features. And finally, again, with this also comes the ability to choose okay, many different technologies. Uh, you're not just constrained by the, the, the technology stack of one cloud provider, but allow yourself to use uh, all of them. And of course, there's also disadvantages. Um, first one is probably the cost. Uh, bandwidth is not free, okay? Uh, and also you risk uh, duplicating your storage, okay? Uh, that's not good, as Aquila was saying before. And also you can get uh, the costs that come with uh, managing such a complex multi-cloud platform. Also you have performance issues. Uh, I mean, really the, the speed of light is fine. It, if you move uh, too much and too far, uh, your performance starts to degrade. Also the bandwidth is not free. Uh, they make you pay for it, of course. And also you have security, meaning the more communication channels you open, the more you have to think about how to secure them. And so how can we can Dremio help with this? Well, again, uh, many of the features that Dremio has uh, allow you to be independent from source technologies, and you can also use that to make yourself independent, not just from a specific source, but from a technology stack. So. The, the ability to virtualize your sources uh, means that you're free to use any supported technology. Uh, and also your consumers, again, are not impacted. You have the ability to cache using reflections, which means you can move less data around and lower your costs, solving the issue with the egress bandwidth. Uh, also, you can sort of move your data where you need it without really moving it. Okay, because you're using a reflection, a cache, you're not merely copying the data, okay? It's very clear here who manages it, where the actual original copy is. And this also gives you a lot of performance improvements. Of course, you get back to your data locality, if you want to think about it. And also, uh, you get one way for consumers to get access to the data, which means you have a uniform security model, uh, less channels to worry about, just one single uh, thing to secure as, approach, as opposed to many, many more of them. So what you do is basically you use Dremio and you layer it on top of your multi-cloud architecture. And this enables you to reduce and manage that complexity. Um, so this is sort of the vision, uh, getting to a platform of platforms. Uh, you can have your domains all around the world. It's free to use uh, some multi-cloud architecture. Your data domains are free to communicate with each other. 
and you have this shared platform that really enables them to, to bring value data. and that's the the beauty of it okay how you can use the data mesh to also enable this kind of of scenarios and with this uh i would say that we reach the end of this journey so i'll hand it over to jeremiah for closing remarks thank you all. Thank you very much, Nicolo and Akile. Um, fantastic presentation. Uh, now we're ready uh, to begin the question and answer portion of, of this presentation. Thank you to all our speakers. That was really insightful. I'm Gemma. I'll be moderating the Q&A. We have lots of great questions come in. And in the interest of time, if we don't get to your question, then we will contact you after the webinar. Unfortunately, Akili from Anel has had to drop, so he's not available for live questions now. So the first question is here. Um, can you give a bit more detail on the um, data product team composition? Um, would you like to take this one, Nicola? Sure. So as we said, uh, the, the data product is really a product. So you structure your team much as you would with a traditional software product. Your data product owner is your product owner, okay? And in your team, you add all the various technical figures uh, that you will need to be, for example, technology experts, depending on the various technologies and tools that you decide to use to build that specific data product. And also, of course, the business domain experts, uh, the ones that actually know what the data really means, and what value is in there and what they want to do with it. Okay. So you do have a multidisciplinary team, okay? You don't go uh, with the old approach, for example, for the data lake in which you only have technology experts on one side and business people on the other. So you really want to make a complete team, okay? Containing all the competence that you need to make a useful data product. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question, do you support private object store on premise like EMC, IBM, Jeremiah? Yeah, um, Dremio does uh, support a number of different object stores. Um, Dell EMC uh, is, is definitely one. Uh, Pure storage is another. Uh, obviously, uh, HDFS and Hadoop. Uh, really, wherever your data is stored, uh, pretty much, Dremio is able to query it in place. Fantastic, thank you. Um, could you please define in detail the roles of data domain owner and data product owner? Nicola, would you like to take this one? So uh, the answer is partly it depends. Uh, the data product owner is relatively standard one. As we mentioned before, it is a product owner. Okay, so it has all the usual responsibility that a product owner has. Uh, he's also responsible in most cases for also uh, deciding whether or not to accept uh, usage requests for the data in the cases where the data is sensible. Uh, the data domain owner is, let's say, a step above uh, because it's actually responsible for an entire data domain, so and also the whole of the data products within it. Uh, he's usually the one that nominates the data product owners, okay? Uh, and he has like oversight uh, duty on the on the data inside the domain. Uh, they usually map to the business domains, okay? The business domain functions that already are responsible for the, the data ownership. And yeah, so that's uh, in what they are distinguished. You can have, of course, data domain owners that are also data product owners, it can happen. But yeah, the detailed responsibilities uh, do depend on your company structure, the industry you're in, uh, how sensible your data is, and all those kind of stuff, unfortunately. Something that you need to adapt to your own reality as well. Thank you. Um, one more for Jeremiah here. How does Dremio support self-service analytics? Sure. Um, so Dremio supports self-service uh, analytics through its uh, semantic layer. 
So um, technical and non-technical data consumers are able to share and access uh, different data products and interact with data across the organization as though it was all residing in the same place. So all based on SQL, um, even non-technical uh, data consumers can explore combine data products into virtual data sets uh, and analyze the data in whatever BI tool they want uh, without needing data engineers to get access to all of the, all of that different data. Great, thank you. Um, what are some of the industries or businesses where you've seen data mesh adoption? Um, would you like to take this one, Nicola? We've seen a couple of them, uh, finance, uh, both banking and insurance, also utilities, of course, uh, since we're talking about that. Uh, there's also a couple industry ones, um, manufacturing, um, but it really isn't uh, something that you can have up in one industry on another. Uh, once you have the scale and the need to actually process the data, there's nothing that says that any other industry can adopt it, but these are the ones that we've seen mo most often. Say. Great, thank you. Um, and Jeremiah, what type of uh, SQL is supported by Dremio? Sure. Uh, so Dremio Sonar based on uh, is based on um, Apache Arrow. So uh, that engine, our, our query engine, is uh, standard ANSI SQL. Um, from a from a storage standpoint, uh, Dremio Arctic, which is our meta store based on Iceberg, um, can can be used with various uh, SQL engines. Um, that's one of the advantages is is uh, openness to to multi engine architectures. Brilliant, thank you. And um, another one for you: Does caching introduce introduce lag? Um, so. I, I would never call Dremio uh, a, a real-time um, solution. We, we're closer to near real-time. Um, you're never going to get around lag from a, uh, from a caching standpoint, but when we're talking about lag, I think most of the time we're talking about uh, in the sub-second sub range. Um, so still very fast, still very performant, still close to or near real-time. Uh, but certainly not what you would get with an in-memory uh, solution. That's fantastic, thank you. Okay, so we're out of time, unfortunately, um, but thank you everyone for attending and we look forward to speaking with you soon. Thank you. Thank you all.